So, ECC RAM. You may or you may not have come across this before. I first came across ECC RAM about 15 odd years ago when we were upgrading the RAM in clients' workstations. We were just buying RAM sticks, whacking them in, hoping for the best and wondering why the systems wouldn't boot. That's when I realized ECC RAM was a thing. <laughs> that was a long time ago, but it was a nice introduction to it. Who knew? Who knew, right? I'm still far from, <laughs> not better now, but I'm still far from a memory expert. I know just about enough to confidently say what I need to say in this video though. So anyway, in short, ECC stands for Error Correcting Code. And ultimately, along with there being like hundreds, if not thousands of different variations of memory, you've got like DDR2, DDR3, DDR4, uh, you've got different memory form factors like regular DIM. You've got SO, SO DIM, which stands for Small Outline Dual Inline Memory Module, which is typically RAM used in laptops. Every one of those generations and form factors comes in different speeds with different latencies as well as that. We've also got ECC and non-ECC memory. So ECC memory modules have a ninth chip on the RAM board, and this is the ECC memory controller. And right, this has been entire theses written on how all this stuff works. So you'll have to forgive me for keeping this moronically simple. I don't pretend or even will imply to understand half the stuff in any of these theses, but I'll give you my best shot, right? When a data byte is sent into RAM, a byte is made up of eight bits, essentially eight ones or zeros. And that byte can make up a character on your screen or a pixel in a photograph through to a decimal point in an employee's pay run. So the ECC memory controller, the ninth chip on the board, well, it performs parity checking on those eight ones and zeros by adding an additional parity bit to every byte. And that parity bit is the total of all the ones in that byte. So if at any point the parity bit doesn't match what was recorded for that specific byte, well, then the ECC RAM knows an error has occurred. And then when the application goes to read that byte, well, then the ECC RAM can figure out there's a problem and then it'll deliver that byte of data to the application in a corrected state based on what it should be when it was originally recorded. So ECC corrects that byte of data. Now it's not perfect. They say it's only likely to detect but not necessarily correct a two bit error in any given byte. So if more than two bits have changed within eight, then it may be too much for ECC RAM to, to recover. But mate, whether that's likely or not, whether there's more than two bits to have changed within eight, I don't know, who knows? If that does happen, you've probably got bigger problems to deal with, but that's the basics of ECC RAM. Right, so we're talking here about like data being changed in RAM, like data corruption on, on, on some kind of, you know, tangible scale here. How does that happen? And surely if this is something to worry about, if it's a thing, why isn't all memory like this and have something built in to fix it? Why doesn't it all have that capability? Well, right. We're talking about ECC RAM checking the sum of all the ones in a byte. The situation we're checking for is called a bit flip. That's when a one changes to a zero or vice versa, a single bit of data flipping to the opposite state. That actually happens, but it's super rare. So things like electrical or magnetic interference inside the computer system or strong cases of it or in the surrounding environment can cause this as well as background radiation caused by cosmic rays. And that intensifies, by the way, with rising altitude, but it's mate, it's nothing to be concerned about unless you're, you're regularly working aboard a cruising airliner where they reckon neutron flux is around 300 times greater than back on solid ground. But even still, how many people have been working on a plane, right? Like with a laptop that doesn't have ECC memory and, you know, at cruising altitude and you've not had garbled mess on a screen. It's just, it's just not something you need to keep at the back of your mind, but it's something that can happen. But of course, there's more to it. Not everyone can even have ECC RAM. So none of Intel's consumer grade CPUs, you know, the core i5s and i9s and i7s, they don't support ECC RAM. So if you've got one of those CPUs, you can't even have this if you want it. AMD Ryzen does support ECC RAM, but you're unlikely to receive it in a pre-built system. So you'd have to find the type of ECC RAM which Ryzen supports and then buy it yourself. And typically ECC RAM has been something that's almost exclusively reserved for servers. Uh, it's, it's, it's a server thing for data centers, that kind of thing, or for Intel based workstations, mobile and desktop. Um, so for the most part, it's a Xeon platform thing, you know, something exclusive to that uh, for us buying workstations. ECC RAM was and still is best placed in servers and data centers, places where data corruption, AKA uh, the bit flipping is unacceptable 
right? Like medical or scientific or financial applications, places where frequent write and access to DRAM is a thing. But you know, I say things like that, right? And then, and then I think to myself, well, hang on a minute. My data was just as important to me as these theoretical kind of financial applications. We always say this, these, these special things are only for these other people who do financial stuff. And like, I don't give a flying f***ing high wind about them people. They like, boo-hoo, a decimal place bopped about for Arasaka Corp or whoever, you know, for the financial projections. Who cares? What does that matter in the grand scheme of the world? You know, to me, my data is just as important than their data is to them. So how about we stop talking about giving all the good stuff to these snowflakes and why, why can't we have some of this good stuff as well? Well, mate, you can. That's the thing. You can have ECC RAM and you can have this technology if you choose to buy a desktop or a mobile workstation equipped with an Intel Xeon CPU, which supports ECC RAM. You, you'll have to spec it in on the spec page, right? You'll have to option it in, but there is a trade-off. Of course there is, right? Because that ninth chip on the ECC RAM board, the one that does the parity checking on the bits, well, it's doing stuff to your data that otherwise wasn't being done before, meaning there's a performance hit to ECC RAM. It's minor. They reckon around 1% to 2% on overall system performance, but it is there. However, there are some other things to think about. And this conversation's changed dramatically as well recently as RAM's changed and developed over the years. Uh, and it probably will change again as we move into like DDR5 when that comes into play. But ECC RAM, generally speaking, when you put it into a workstation, it can't be overclocked, right? It runs at slower frequencies than non-ECC RAM. Uh, however, you now can spec in ECC RAM at frequencies which aren't even that too far off non-ECC RAM options, something that until recently, uh, there was a far bigger gap between. So if you look at this spec page here on, a, on the Dell mobile workstation page, you can put in ECC RAM at 2933 megahertz which is on a higher DDR4 standard, which isn't miles off the 3200 megahertz speeds, which are available with a non-ECC RAM. So if you want ECC, you will be running at RAM, which is 267 megahertz slower with that additional passive one to 2% overall system performance hit. But mate, that's probably very unlikely to be noticeable on a desktop platform. Uh, and without having two identical systems, like here side by side, one with ECC RAM and one without it, it's it's impossible to measure what that actually really means. And unfortunately, I don't have enough parts here to show you a perfect test. Uh, the systems that I do have with ECC RAM in here, uh, they've got 2666 megahertz ECC RAM, but if I put in non-ECC RAM into those systems, those consumer modules will default down to 2133 megahertz. Uh, and Dell and HP workstations don't have the ability in the BIOS to apply you know, memory overclocks and XMP profiles. So what I'd be doing is comparing 2666 megahertz ECC RAM to 2133 megahertz non-ECC RAM. So whatever the result of any tests that I do to compare them would just be open to arguments. So let's do it anyway. Uh, so <laughs> it's an HP Z2 G4 workstation. It's a cracker of a machine. It's equipped with a six core Xeon 2176G. Uh, it's got the Quadro P5000 in and one's going to have 32 gigs of ECC and then the other's going to have 32 gigs of non-ECC. Running my new Invermark benchmark test for Rotor Desk and Bender. I don't have any favorite Just give me any kind Even if it hurts a bit I think I will be fine wasn't really conclusive <laughs> it was in some ways because if anything it showed that 
actually the lower RAM frequencies have a bigger hit on performance than ECC itself, which to be fair, using the word bigger in this context is a bit overly dramatic. We're talking about like a second per test in all of those test cases that you saw, a fraction of a second here, you know, a second there, you know, less than a percent difference between each of the tests. One of them was always going to come out on top, but honestly, I'd argue the lower frequency of the non-ECC RAM, which was running at 2133 megahertz, was the Achilles heel. If I did have the non-ECC RAM running at 2666 megahertz, then my guess is things would have been very much even, right? You know, and weirdly enough, the, the main differentiator between most of those tests, like the biggest gap, was my part modeling test. I wasn't expecting that. But the functions, the routines that I have in there seem to be extremely sensitive to memory configurations. So much so that whilst I was doing all these tests, I ran a 16 gig RAM config in single channel mode uh, for the modeling test, one stick of RAM. And my modeling test tanked big style, like massively, but with 16 gigs of RAM in dual channel mode, so two by eight sticks of RAM, crunched that test much quicker. So I don't know, I'm just excited more than anything else that I've got a test that opens up kind of a world of possibilities here and testing scenarios that just couldn't do before. And you'll be able to use these as well once I release this out to the big wide world. But anyway, conclusion to that was ECC RAM actually did not slow that system down on what were very strenuous 3D CAD tests. So I'm happy enough there to conclude that, yeah, ECC RAM made pretty much no difference whatsoever. So, right, anyway, enough about what it is and what it does. If you're buying a workstation or a mobile workstation for 3D CAD, should you spec in ECC RAM? <laughs> right, I, I don't know, you know, nobody can say whether you'll ever experience a bit flip in memory. You know, nobody's gonna, nobody can say that's definitely gonna happen, but, after speaking with the guys who actually write the code for Autodesk Inventor, they say, in general, we have no opinions if the customer should get ECC RAM or not. That's what they say. The domain of CAD applications does not really fit into the category of mission critical long running applications. Data corruptions happen in many forms and this is just one of them. So by long running applications, they mean that typically data in regular desktop applications isn't held in RAM for any great length of time it's kind of written and then read by the application quite quickly. Uh, most CAD applications as well already have their own built-in validations during the save and the open operations to filter out some of these cases as well. So, uh, And most crashes that you'll have experienced in the past are probably mostly down to programmatic errors rather than bit flips. Uh, now, it is true as well that data in RAM can be exposed to other factors that cause bit flips, right? Like alpha decay, electrically charged particles from the RAM casing itself or other parts of the PC, or even electrical interference from the 12 volt rail inside the system itself. But mate, these are all massive, just possibly coulds, theoretical ifs. You know, and speaking for myself, after 25 years of using a computer, I haven't ever encountered anything like this, right? So do you need ECC RAM? Well, this is where the, it, this is where it's like entirely up to you and it's a massive gamble. It's, it is, that's it, it's just a big, that depends. I consider it to be more like an insurance policy with a minimal cost, right? Over the entire use of a system, who knows, right? If you owned a system for five years, who knows if a bit was ever flipped? Probably not. Even if it did, it probably wouldn't have made any difference to a CAL application, but, it is an extra layer of safety, which in a mobile or a fixed workstation, you know, nowadays the financial cost isn't even a factor anymore. In an ex it's an extra £16.90 to convert 32 gigs of RAM to ECC or £14.30 to convert 64 gigs of RAM to ECC. So do you want that insurance policy for £14.30 or what, $18 for America? Like you, you literally notice nothing different when you've got it in day-to-day -day use. The performance hit is like literally absolutely nothing remotely close to being noticeable, right? The performance hit is not the difference between a good or a bad laptop. It's not the difference between hitting a deadline or not. We're like we're, we're literally talking about like the, a mere second here or there per operation, which like frankly is like, 
<laughs> really? You know, if, if, you, if you're counting the seconds like that during your working day, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, what do you do on coffee breaks and sneezing? <laughs> you know, if you, if you sneeze at work and you, you lose five seconds, what do you do? Do you have to work super hard over the next five seconds to catch the time back up? I mean, come on. So for me, I've always put ECC RAM in just kind of knowing it isn't that much of a performance hit. It, it doesn't slow anything down. <laughs> knowing it's a passive, if not kind of meaningless security measure, it's still a layer of safety at a negligible cost. So I just put it in and I put it in all my workstations. And after all, it is a benefit of the Xeon platform and you, you are kind of paying for it through Xeon as well. And for me, it makes up the trifecta of professional workstation properties. The Intel Xeon CPU and its platform, the Pro NVIDIA Quadro graphics, and then the ECC RAM. Those are the three unique qualities to a workstation that stand them aside from a regular consumer gaming grade system. But then I have no doubt there'll be a canny few people who will just flat out refuse to accept any of the conclusions from, from this video, probably based on the fact that like the, the tests that I did, the comparison tests were sort of slower non-ECC RAM versus faster ECC RAM and just attribute the results to that rather than the presence of ECC. But like, where do you stop with finding flaws and comparisons like this? Like, even if I was to get hold of 2666 megahertz non-ECC RAM and compare it to 2666 ECC RAM, chances are the timings and latencies on either or RAM will be different, right? You, can, you can't tune them in the workstation BIOS. You know, BIOS and workstations is completely different at consumer ports. So look, the fact that these tests were so close for me personally, I can confident I I can confidently say that ECC RAM basically mate, it's got no meaningful performance impact on our work, right? You know, we, we can't enable XMP profiles on workstation. So the fastest non-ECC DDR4 we can use would be 3200 megahertz. And going from 2933 ECC to 3200 non-ECC, honestly, mate, I can't see that being worth it to me. I'll, I'll take the probably pointless insurance policy over what would probably be a fraction of a second saved here and there over the working day. So there you have it. Like I know for sure, having done all of this, uh, it's helped me iron out a few queries that I had uh, and you know, help us understand a few things that I didn't quite know about all of this. So if it did for you as well, and you found this video genuinely useful info, then please do tell YouTube all about it by nutting the like button and getting subscribed if you haven't already. It's digital motivation for us YouTubers. More videos coming soon based around Invmark. So take on the bell if you want YouTube to let you know about any videos that are uploaded and ready to watch. So thanks again for your time. Thanks for watching. Hope you found it useful and I'll see you all in the next one. Doodles. <laughs>